And we are back with an all new episode of Keep It. I'm Ira Madison III, and I am here in the studio with my sister, my coworker. <laughs> it's such a throwback. I'm Louis Bertel, here feeling like it's 2019. This is an old style Keep It, for those who have been around since the beginning. Quibi is around, it's we, downstairs. Once upon a time you would walk into this building and there would be Quibi nearby and you'd be like, oh, I wonder what, that's the future. I wonder what they're <laughs> cooking up this week. And it turns out they were cooking up bankruptcy. Someone was making a joke about Quibi at a party the other night. And I was like, well, first of all, I got a really good check from Quibi. Oh, that's right, you worked for them, yeah. Um, Nikki Fresh. Yes. Yeah, Nicole Richie. Which Nikki wasn't. Uh, <laughs> they canceled that right quick. They canceled all of them, though. That's true, yeah. Everything lasted literally 15 minutes. Actually, the app set up to do what it did. And I think they're all they're all somewhere else, because someone told me they saw that show, but they said they didn't see it on Quibi. Oh, okay. So I think they're all on, what's the thing that's not Voodoo, Apple TV? Voodoo, Tubi, Tubi? Well, there's Voodoo, there's Tubi. No, the thing that's not Apple TV. Oh. Or 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 Amazon. Roku? Yeah, Roku. Got it. There we yes. go. Okay. I remember every once in a while someone would be like, Oh, I have a Roku stick. I'll go and watch that. Will you? I don't know. No. Yeah. Um anyway, I am in LA because I'm getting an award this evening. I hope it's reason. not a trap. <laughs> <laughs> uh I'm getting arrested. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I'm getting an Ambi, which is um I'm sorry, Ambies. Um, shout out to them. But I've been Googling like all week what Ambie stands for. And I don't think it stands for anything. It's about podcasting, right? Yeah, it is about podcasting. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. None of those letters are P. No, no. You know, but maybe it rhymes with, I don't know. Okay. Uh, rhymes with Bambi. Love Ambie, him. Ambie, audio, music, books, ideas, <laughs> education. And allies. Say that. Yes. <laughs> um, but no, I'm getting an audio impact award. So okay. thank you, Ambies. Malcolm Gladwell is also being honored. So Get obviously, the fuck out. yeah, we're on the same wow. plan here. And Trixie Mattel's hosting. I don't know what's going on at this award show. <laughs> <laughs> all right if you get her in full glam that means some money went yeah. into it uh john lovett will also be there because this is his first nomination for best comedy podcast we've never been nominated for this award by the way mm. but he's getting nominated but you get an impact award okay yeah. yeah one day we'll get into the comedy sphere i don't know <laughs> laughs will be generated somehow we'll have a meeting we'll figure it out well you know i had plenty of laughs i was telling you t today uh, last night i went to the chateau marmont I was being very L.A. Yeah, being somebody's dad wanting to see whatever, Seth Green out in the wild. <laughs> Actually, so I was having drinks with our producers, um, Kendra and Chris. Yes, we enjoy. Uh, and I was supposed to have drinks at Harlow with friends. And then I ran into the problem that I forgot L.A. has. Why is every restaurant here closed on Monday and Tuesday? Oh, yeah, no. The the restaurant ex right next to my house like is open like 3 days a week, like it's a miniature golf course or something. Yeah, so that was closed. I also really wanted to go to this new place called Holy Water, which is next to Nora. Not named after the Madonna song from Rebel Heart. No. Okay. I I, I do love that song though. Uh, love is strong. There's th that's how you want to four good songs on that album. Yeah, but there's definitely four good songs. I just don't know if that's one of them. <laughs> um it's this new place by I guess like Woody Harrelson. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Who, uh, on a good day is probably a fun hangout. And other days, I don't want to hear his ideas. You know what? He used a collection of icons in the Katniss movies. Oh, Hunger Games. Hunger Games. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Too much coffee today. Yeah. And I can't remember Hunger Games. Uh, but no, anyway, we ended up going to the Chateau because uh, I was like, this is tacky. Let's go. Mm -hmm. It's fun. And everyone was there. So I was like, okay, so the girls are still going to the Chateau. Which Run is shocking. Yeah. yeah. Run into Chloe Sevigny. Which, a rare LA sighting. This yes. should be my life, and yet it is yours. Also, I did that weird thing with a celebrity where you see them, and then you smile at them, because it's like, you sort of feel like you know them. <laughs> right. And she looked, she was with her son, and like gave me this look, like, let me get my child and run away <laughs> from you. Uh, mostly because I've met her brother, oh. but I'm like what are you supposed to say like when she's in a hotel lobby with her child like, right i know your brother right or yeah um, you're one of the swans yeah um was i ran into alice edelman there whom we love keep it uh uh alum yeah um i ran into um catherine newton lisa frankenstein's own yes okay i will apologize to catherine newton on this podcast because when she first walked out i was like 
I was worried with Sabrina Carpenter. And there she was is like, kind of I a category that. of young stars that happens to, mm -hmm. that all kind of belong facially to each other. Thomas and Mackenzie is in this yeah. world. Yeah. Um, they were also with Zelda Williams, director of Lisa Frankenstein, yeah. daughter of Robin Williams, who is very chic, like dyke energy, but mm -hmm. she's not. Um, she she was dressed just like me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like little fair energy. Yeah. Well, excuse me. I think the Venn diagram is, you know, <laughs> a circle. Um, I'm saying this in like in a compliment. She was dressed so chic, like she was dressed like blue from Tailspin. Oh, wow. An adventurer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like and like and like pilot coat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh she looked very hot. An aviatrix. Yeah. Um, and then who else ambles out but Casey Affleck? We got to put our best actor winners somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and today it was the Chateau Marmont. Fine actor. Amazing actor, actually. I wish he would go back to that. Yeah. Actually, he was in Oppenheimer. Right. Yeah. But, but again, who wasn't? Yeah. Um, if you were, a, if you were a, 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 a worn down looking man, you had to be an Oppenheimer. <laughs> it's like how we used to put them all in Westerns. You got to be an Oppenheimer now. Yeah. Um, so those were my... LA Adventures. Honestly, last night. that's a lot for a fucking Monday. You did pretty well. Yeah, thank you. Which is crazy because I'm going to New York tonight. Yeah. For the rest of the week. And I organized my New York trips around seeing plays. So I'll be seeing Cola Scola's Oh Mary. Cola Scola is like amazing this, uh, fucking show. I'm so excited to see it. They play Mary Todd Lincoln, which by the way is a hilarious reference anyway. Like when, <laughs> when I have a friend who's going through it, I'll be like, he's Mary Todd Lincoln crazy right now. <laughs> And apparently it's a uh, a very farcical movie. Conrad Ricamora, who is in Fire Island, he's also in it. Mm -hmm. um, the star, by the way, aside from Cole. Yeah. You know, uh, James Scully is also James in it, who's amazing. Uh, the whole cast is really fucking funny, but Conrad is like, Conrad is so hot. He's always gorgeous. As like, very appealing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to say about Cola Scola, I'm so glad that this play is catching on because Cola Scola is one of the wilder people to exist in yes. terms of any comedy <laughs> it's sort of like if amy sedaris was multiplied by queerness i yeah. mean you know so it's already weird and you're getting to this other place um i remember cola scola one time talking about how they purchased an old actual dress that olivia de Havilland wore to the oscars or something in the 1980s so it's this so in the 1980s olivia de Havilland is already mm. old it's like, so it's granny wear <laughs> that Cole somehow came across. It's just so amazing. I'm so psyched to see it. And I'm also seeing the Sarah Paulson play appropriate. Or is it appropriate? I don't know because I haven't seen it yet. Okay. But it is a Brandon Jacob Jenkins play. You know, he wrote um, The Octoroon. So mm. uh, it could be appropriate or it could be appropriate. Mm. Um, I don't know. I have I, That one is on my list to see. It was just extended. So uh, um, all I know is she's not going to be performing on stage in, in any way that Holland Taylor would say is less than an A+. Plus. So I, <laughs> I know she's there taking notes. Uh, to wrap that up and connect it to appropriate or appropriate, how do you pronounce Rihanna's album? Which, Someone asked me this recently. Oh, 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 anti. Okay, you're right. Yes. It's anti. Uh, someone was, someone like a friend sent me a text. Um, it was like, I'm having a hot debate. Is it anti or anti? And I was like, I remember there's this interview that she did with the paparazzi. She was like, anti, like anti everything. And I'm like, okay, Rihanna. I feel like if you're talking about just the prefix, it's anti. Yeah. Um, I, I obviously they're like antithesis. There's different ways to pronounce it when it's connected to words, but I would say anti is correct. Okay, what's happening on the show today? Yeah. So um, first of all, we have the Veronicas as a guest. I am first of all instantly transported back to college, where I am listening to only the Veronicas, wearing exactly <laughs> a purple American Apparel hoodie. Um, I wish I still had that hoodie. It fit, felt great. But yeah. their music is so consistent, and their new album is fabulous. Yeah, um, listen, they've been untouched by us for so long, uh, and now they're here. Got it. And also, we're going to talk about music genre shifts specifically, because Cowboy Carter is coming. And we'll talk about how optimistic we are about Cowboy Carter. I am actually very optimistic, to be honest. Okay, you're going to have to defend that. It's going to yes, be exciting. Yes, Imagine me not being optimistic for Beyonce album. Well, you do it out of fear, yeah, right? Yeah, that's like you not being optimistic for, I don't know. Amy Mann's line of tea bags. Ding. Yes. <laughs> now we said it. You stay in a Tivana. She would have an album called Earl Grey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, also, the hot new movie everybody is talking about is Immaculate. Yes. Uh, so we're going to talk about nuns in movies. Which it turns out is fascinating and 
there are so many tropes associated with nuns in movies, and we'll figure out why we're so um, enamored of their lifestyle, shall we say. Yeah, and why are the best nuns in any movie that one scene in Charlie and Angels? Yes. Wow. Yeah. 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 They did a lot there. Yeah. All right. We will be back with more Keep It. It's Cowboy Carter Week, and to quote Queen Bee herself, this ain't a country album. This is a Beyonce album. But- Technically true. I mean, nobody was questioning that. I don't know why that needed to be established. <laughs> this ain't a country album. This is a Lady Swift Black Mombasa <laughs> album. <laughs> We're going back to Graceland with Beyonce. <laughs> Either way, it's still a genre shift for an iconic artist. So to celebrate, we're going to run through some of our favorite musicians who have made genre shifts in their careers. I think it's hard to categorize this because the fact of the matter is, if a genre shift is successful, you don't even think of it as a shift. You know, it's so organic to them Mm -hmm. that it just works. I think the greatest genre shift of all time is the Bee Gees going into disco. Like yeah. now that you have to explain to people that they were basically folk artists and that they're at, at the beginning of their career with songs like Massachusetts, they existed alongside like the mamas and the papas. <laughs> like that's something you have to like explain to people. It doesn't seem rational anymore. But they I mean, how pissed would you have been to be a disco artist alongside the Bee Gees as they just come up and decide to be the best at it? I mean, that must have been so wild. Yeah. I mean, Saturday Night Fever is still you throw that on. That's like the most iconic like disco album you've heard and then also it's like let's say you're not super enamored of these three fluffy white men singing disco then they intersperse a couple other artists too it's a soundtrack yeah so you can just put that on and um enjoy that but i mean like once they appear and like jive talking and into the main tracks on that album like uh uh staying alive you uh you should be dancing night fever i just like how did they get all of this in one album it's it feels like you would have to spend 30 years to construct all of that well you know that's when people made albums yeah right (laughs) now it feels like we get five albums a year but there are seven hundred thousand releases a year yeah um i actually didn't even know that about the beaches until i saw that documentary yeah which is amazing by the way it's like one of the few good music documentaries that has come out in the past few years and as trace Lissette reminded us uh lorene scafaria is doing a bg's biopic sometime in the future and that i'm excited for i because we don't have the casting on that yet as no. far as i know i'm very curious i wonder what they'll do you think justin's trying to get in there you fucking know he is. Okay, well, I was excited. <laughs> we like, were look- having fun, and then you said Justin Timberlake is going to be in the Bee Gees biopic. Look at my SNL take. You know what? He did a genre shift into bad music. <laughs> but <laughs> the genre of bad. I like, I like. You we, go to Best Buy. Let me go to the bad section. We talked about it last week. Um, where, where I, I like the album. Yeah. Um, though, but he did his whole country shift. See, that's, right, the, that's yeah. the whole thing about. The country shifts because for a lot of people it feels like they're, I don't know, like getting to their roots or something. Like country always feels like the roots, you right? Know? Yeah, and also I, I, unless of course you're Lady Gaga, in which place you did country to prove you can do it or to prove you can sound like Pink. Weirdly, I think she did not like that aunt. Right. <laughs> I, think, think- I, I think this was. I think this was some like Beyonce's Cowboy Carter is getting revenge on the CMAs and the people who are racist towards her. I think she had a bone to pick with Joanne and her mom and, d- and dad, like opening that restaurant, Joanne's Trattoria. She was like, I'm tired of hearing about this bit. <laughs> so I'm going to make music <laughs> that is the worst of mine <laughs> to sabotage her. It's always 4D chess with her, which yeah. by the way, okay, I'm sorry to indulge this. What did you think of Azealia Banks' rant about Car- Cowboy Carter? Did you think about it? No. Are you trying to get me killed? I'm, <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. As you know, I do love Azealia Banks. Um, you know, even though, as I've mentioned before, um, she did say that podcasts are the brokest form of media. In my <laughs> well, d- it's not the richest. Yes, in my DMs. I am so sad that I never that the argument that I had with her was not public. How did that happen? Yeah, I'm not in the Wikipedia list of beefs. Oh, I see. What? Yeah, I hope I screenshotted that. I should post it someday. Yeah, well, yeah. good. Now it can be vintage. Yeah, yeah. vintage fight. Yeah. Um, now, I am always willing to entertain a critique of Beyonce, and I always love um, Azealia's cultural critiques. Honestly, 
you know, I she should have a podcast. To be honest, if if <laughs> anyone was podcast worthy, it is this person. I would be listening to it. Okay, she's like she could revive Pitchfork. Yeah, <laughs> no. To, can she, by the way, she can turn ten words into five thousand. Okay, also, she, which is what a podcast is. Okay, she could get them out of the nine eleven rubble and yeah. bring them back. <laughs> uh, let's reference to a Halsey tweet. <laughs> uh, but my whole thing of when that came out, I was like, none of us have heard the album. Right. It's that everyone has been jumping to do a quick, like, we're talking about Cowboy Carter, like, we're critiquing, like, Beyonce's intent or whatever. I'm like, you've heard two songs. Right. This critique that she put out, she was saying that it was inspired by either some random white person criticizing her or mm. something. And then she, she made this album in response to that. And she criticized the iconography, uh, the a- album cover of Cowboy Carter and mm. what it what it stands for. And then she did say something I thought was interesting, which is that Beyonce deserved a rock vocal Grammy for Sugar, Sugar Mama. Mama from B I Day, will right? I always agree with that, bitch. My, sorry, sorry to be, this is like the least interesting part of what <laughs> Azalea was talking about. Would you call that a rock vocal? I would. You would, okay. I would. Sugar Mama, like It that. sounds too much like one thing by Amory to me. Mm. Which no. maybe that's rock? Is it? No, isn't that... Um, Crazy in Love? Yeah, I guess. I don't know. It's it's just so like, I don't know. It feels like it has that like country, like, you know, what what are those mics they use in the in country music? I th- that like Chris Christopherson will have yeah, set up before you know, him. Like those. Like it feels it feels like that. It feels down home. You got know? It, it feels it. like they're singing that in the best little whorehouse. Sure. Like Ooh. those are the sugar mamas. <laughs> Um, that <laughs> people are paying for. Uh, <laughs> the I love yes. that song so much. It's actually my favorite Beyonce song. It's really? My fa- yes, my favorite, hands down. Not get me bodied. No, it's Sugar Mama. Okay, it, it always has been, and it's also there was this funny thing online recently where people were discussing uh, um, how B Day is Beyonce's loudest album. <laughs> Oh, ring the alarm. Yes. They said every- Deja Vu has screamed yeah, at you. They said that entire album is in capitals. <laughs> and you, when you listen to that song, it's like, yeah, ring the alarm. She's screaming. Sugar, the end is Sugar Mama. Like, she's just screaming yes um, and, like, sit on Mama's lap. And, yeah, freak them dress. Um, you're holding up traffic. Green means go. Like, she's just screaming the entire album. Now, and it's great. In retrospect, maybe all of the albums that followed are just her being like, let me settle down. <laughs> like, the vocal rest compared to that album. She was also on one in that performance era. And so it was, I'm excited for the, I'm excited for the country album, but I'm more excited for the rumored rock album. Because uh, when she was performing, like, even Deja Vu on um, the Tyra show. Like she, she was just like that era. Beyonce was just so she was giving so much on stage. Convulsive. Yes. Yes. Um, now, Tina Turner ask, you know, like that was the rock era. So we'll get Madonna out of the way quickly. What's interesting is for all of her reinventions, there really weren't wasn't much in the way of a genre shift. Like it was yeah. all some version of pop. But I think my favorite of hers would be bedtime story uh-huh. like the way that we love body language by Kylie, where it's mm-hmm. I would never have thought R and B were a natural fit for either of these people and then it turned out to really suit their shall we say chill vocal you know bedtime stories is like my favorite and i love she's done so many almost genre shifts like you would almost think that don't tell me was like a whole country era but it wasn't right well it's also it kind of like obviously there was the country art on that album but like not much on that album is truly like country troubadour shit like i deserve it sounds a little bit like yeah. that but for the rest of it is like a continuation of ray of light i would say that almost also kind of all over the place yes because you go from like music to don't tell me and then i'm like what else is even on that album no like that country ish ballad gone at the yeah. end or paradise not for me which is like electronic it, it, she was merging a bunch of styles there. not my fave yeah um you know speaking of another blonde um chanteuse there's gwen stefani who was oh. rock and like you know punk as well sort of like ska um, her also her number one favorite genre shift is race uh, <laughs> <laughs> now she's a native american <laughs> that was in the looking hot video yes from no doubt um, i also forget that in the mid 90s she straight up had a bindi yeah right not right not I right mean, who didn't <laughs> okay I, I guess the answer is everybody had, I had, a, I had a bindi and a tamagotchi yeah um <laughs> she went straight into pop which is it's actually so wild to try and tell like a Gen Z person um, that this version of Gwen Stefani existed before. Because, you know, no doubt it's playing Coachella. And I think a lot of people are going to be like, 
but what are these songs? Right. No, I mean they're really old. They're oldies now. These are like thirty years old yeah. songs. But um, I it, it it's interesting only because once she went pop, it felt so inevitable. Like you knew she would never return to something resembling rock again. Yeah. Like even her subsequent no doubt releases like Push and Shove, like that's not rock music. No. Not, not that they were ever purely rock and. Uh, divorced from pop, but mm-hmm. they they were never going to go back to that. I mean, she told you what she wanted, you know. Like, yeah, she just she, she wanted to be married. She wanted to be a wife. Yes, she she didn't want to be doing push ups on the stage. <laughs> yes, which was a fine era, but it's like once upon a time you would have considered them contemporaries to I don't know Green Day, and then yeah, that I mean, totally Smashing went Pumpkins. away. Yeah, like, they were that whole um, not warped. The Lollapalooza. Yeah, so yes, they were they were that whole Lollapalooza era, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but now they're not anymore i think we can safely say that some of the best and worst genre shifts in music come from people attempting disco (laughs) and if you have not checked out karen carpenter's shelved disco album (laughs) there is one song that is fucking amazing which is called my body keeps changing my mind okay and they almost they shelved it because they thought it was not in fitting with you know her image of being an adult contemporary Mm -hmm. queen but a song was written for that album that I, I think she must have recorded, but or no, no, she turned it down. "Rock with You" by Michael Jackson was written for Karen Carpenter. Oh, how okay. crazy! When you listen to the album, it's not that surprising because it's like a chill, dancey vibe as yeah. that song is. But for Michael Jackson, obviously, that's more of a one of one of the lighter tracks on a harder dance album off that's the wall. Cookout music, yeah, <laughs> precisely. You're not invited, <laughs> but Karen. <laughs> Karen is. Karen is. Let's talk about Karen Carpenter's potato salad. <laughs> if you could take ingredients out of plain water, it would be that. She has the vibe of like you know, nice white teacher um, who lends me um, my favorite book in middle school. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, how nice of you. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what she is. Yeah. Um, who who else is going disco? Um, Barbara Streisand, really of course. Okay, that worked though. Well, it's like well, when you can sing fucking anything, yeah, and then you have Donna Summer, the other person who can sing anything. Mm-hmm. That song is fantastic. Yeah, enough is enough. Yeah, obviously, and then it feels like cocaine is being invented there. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I know that it existed before, <laughs> but the levels they're going to are zhuzhed up. Would you qualify guilty as disco? In the way that I would say Karen Carpenter's solo album is disco, okay. I would, I, I would concur. It definitely has uh, Barry Gibb on it. It's it's easy listening. Yeah. Which is which is weird. It's like to say like something is cuz like easy listening obviously like is the station, but it's weird when you hear music that is easy listening. Uh I would classify like the Backstreet Boys as easy listening. Right. Also that's guilty is something that would I think ordinarily be called yacht rock except yeah. a woman is singing on it That's which fair. i feel i feel like women don't get to be yacht rock generally women speaking. Are on yachts i always have bitches on my yachts as a rule yeah, yeah. so bitches and dollars. affirmative action for you yeah <laughs> <laughs> um you know who should have done like a disco shift do you remember the get down uh, Baz Luhrmann show oh it's like the most expensive show of all time or something yeah um christina aguilera has a song on it that now rogers wrote mm. um that song is amazing. And I'm like, why didn't she go into disco? But honestly, she's a person who has so many genres that I felt like she could have gone into, but didn't. Because she has such an amazing voice, but she loves to caterwaul. Yeah. Is the concern that she can't dance? Do you have to dance to be a disco artist, though? Barbara Streisand obviously is not, you know, yeah. giving us the uh, John Travolta on the dance floor. I but... feel like you could be a disco artist who moves or there's very much the vibe of just like you're a woman in disco and you're just sort of like, you know, moving the hands. Well, this is what While we... men dance around you. Smart. Um, this is also, of course, what we love about ABBA, where they sang about dancing, couldn't <laughs> dance and compensated <laughs> by pointing. <laughs> That's called a white solution. <laughs> Um okay, there's obviously also Taylor Swift, who went from who went from country to pop, the opposite. Yes. And also talk about the most inevitable shift ever. Yeah. That's sort of like I, I mean, I would also compare it to Casey Muff's grades in a way. Once you get to a certain level, it would be weird if you only did country. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just like you're it's like the world is begging for your audience to be bigger. It's like trying to expand. Um and now she makes woodland flute music. Yeah. <laughs> I have to tell you. The album is sinking its leafy tendrils into me. I saw you on Instagram posting about it. I am not listening to that album. Throw on Jade Green. (laughs) I know you enjoy a blunt from time to time. (laughs) 
you and your I'm people. Sm- I'm smoking over here. <laughs> <laughs> you enjoy blunt from time to time. I do. Yeah. Because I don't, obviously. Oh, yeah. Um, um, okay. It, it's, I think the lyrics are still maybe her worst ever, but in terms of every once in a while, you do want a vibe. I'm sorry to say that. And that it, it, it does sufficiently do, do something. I do love vibes, you yeah. know, but like there's a new Empress of album. Like that's vibes. Mm, right, you know? right, right. Tyler's album's out. That's vibes. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm vibing. Right, I'm not concerned about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the vibrations are good. Yeah. No, you're Vibe Magazine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, who, who else? We, uh, we, obviously, we should talk about oh, yeah. that time in the early 2000s when a ton of rock artists went and attempted pop. And I think our favorite, if I'm doing a Metacritic um, average of our taste, is Garbage. Yes. When yes. Garbage did Beautiful Garbage, I think that's some of their best music. It is a gorgeous album. And I like, first of all, like, I, I know Shirley Manson. Um, Which, how did this happen? I'm just saying, I'm Lewis, right? <laughs> Shirley Manson walks in. Who is she picking to hang out with? <laughs> you? We what? Have, <laughs> we have two random connections. One, um, I feel like my friend Sean Connolly, like years ago, sort of like knew her, but also... I went to like garbage signings, okay. uh, album signings, and like I tweeted her. They don't before. have a bad album, by the way. I no, love garbage. absolutely not. Um, I tweeted her before something, but like she is a person who remembers all of her fans, like truly. Well, yeah. Like I was in the, when I first went to get um one of my albums signed at like at um not Tower Records um whatever one in L.A. that is still open but it moved. Oh, Amoeba. Okay, Amoeba. I went there and. She was like saying hi, like people in that line who like she's known for years. So wow, she remembers people's faces. And then also before I'm my old trainer in Los Angeles, um, she goes to him. Got it. Got so it. I went okay, in of once. Yeah, I when I was like, I went in once. And I'm leaving, and I'm like, wait, is this Shirley Manson coming in? And I walk in, and yeah, so we realize we have the same trainer. Also, that is. An amazing skill set if she really remembers fans that well, especially since there's something about uh, women from the 90s, really, where like fans connected with them in such a way. I just read a story about how a fan went up to ta- uh, to Tori Amos mm-hmm. and said, your music saved my life. And she said back, no, you saved your life or something. And it mm-hmm. was meant to sound supportive. And yet also, I believe that is self-protection because who needs to hear these stories of treachery yeah. from fans who were saved by your... It's just it's too much for one person to deal with. Um. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there's a few people who like really remember people. I mean, I feel like I feel like Gaga remembers people. Probably. Well, I think Taylor Swift is honestly really good at that. Yeah. You well, know, I mean, obviously there's well, way too keep, many she's fans. She's keeping a file. Yeah. <laughs> Some <laughs> it, it's like the Devil Wears Prada. The two assistants behind her are like writing it down. She's tracking them like the X-Men. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there's 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 a registry. Yeah. <laughs> the FBI is on the dial. Yeah. And she also has all their social security numbers and credit cards. <laughs> she's like, she calls the she calls them up. I see you did not buy six vinyls last week. What's going on? <laughs> oh my god it is it is weird to think about what she's aware of and what she isn't because she's got to be a chronically online person in some secretive way right yeah okay burner so accounts etc i'm gonna get to this in my keep it okay which is about kate middleton Ooh. uh but i was talking about this yesterday with kendra um about you know like what people are aware of right yeah like when you think of the crown and you think of Kate Middleton yes obviously in this castle you know princess peached up yep um what does she watch and what does she consume and the question is do people watch whatever she's going to watch before she watches it <laughs> ooh like if she's like I want to watch this new Julia Roberts movie is it someone's job to watch the movie first to make sure that it's okay for her to watch God, that's a good question. I assume it's like a case per case basis. Yeah. Like some things seem more um, problematic up front mm-hmm. than you than other things. But you're God. I wonder because because each individual person in the royal castle is like has like a siloed off team. Yeah. So it's like they got to be doing something. And I feel like Harry and Meghan are the only ones who are constantly online. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone else, it's like no phones, no yeah. nothing. Yeah. Kate Middleton, simply gorgeous hair in that video she released though. Yeah. I it mean, was like this. Sacred? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was dynasty. Yeah. All right. Uh, when we are back, we will be joined by the, I mean, iconic Veronica's. The fabulous Veronica's. Yeah. You know our guests from their iconic hits like Untouched and Forever. 
In My Blood. They're an Australian powerhouse that has captivated audiences worldwide with their distinctive sound, unapologetic lyrics, and mesmerizing presence. And we are thrilled to talk about their really fucking great new album, Gothic Summer. Uh, please welcome to keep it the amazing, the dazzling Jessica and Lisa of the Veronicas. Hi, Angels. Oh, Hi. 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 <laughs> and you just told us you're in California right now. You're about to kick off a tour. What's your history with just being in the L.A. area? Like you're from Brisbane. So what what's yeah. your what's your take on our side of the universe, our hemisphere? Los Angeles is a home away from home for us. We actually moved here when we were 19 years old for the first time from Brisbane. And so it was a very long time ago now. Um, and uh, we were making some music over here. So for us, it's like we know it as well as we know Australia. Um, you know, back then it was like Google Maps. You, you didn't have a GPS. So I would print out the instructions to go to all of our sessions and we'd drive there. And so I know the streets like the back of my hand. <laughs> I, you just brought up a memory that is I needed on Earth, which is I would print out directions when I moved here in 2009. What could be more harrowing than navigating through L.A. with just words near you on the passenger side seat? So horrible. 100%. 100%. And I was like, we are not taking taxis. I'm going to learn these streets. And, um, you know, and then songwriting sessions were anywhere from like had to learn how to get to Calabasas and then all the way to like, you um, you know echo park so it was like one end of of la to the other and we love it here there's so much energy there's so much spirit it's you know a town of collaboration and and health food and you know we've learned so much growing up here we did a lot of partying obviously early on in the first like five years of living here because we were from brisbane we you know hadn't left australia really beyond a couple of holidays so um it was very exciting to be here for the first time and and sort of growing up in in Los Angeles in our 20s. Yeah, uh, you recently had an interview with um, Britney Spanos in the Rolling Stone, who I adore. Um, you talked about how this album sort of came as almost a surprise, like you were, you know, just having coffee and you were like, um, the yeah. album just sort of like came to you. Like sort of what's it like where you weren't planning an album really and then there's a spark happens and you're like, well, I guess we're doing an album and now I guess we're going yeah. on tour when you hadn't planned it. <laughs> so it was it was spontaneous. And for us, we, uh, we're songwriters first and foremost. So we're always writing in the studio. Um, we just weren't necessarily creating music or an album for the Veronicas. So, um, you know, we went to our friend's house. His name's John Feldman and he has this home studio in Calabasas. And he works with so many incredible artists. He's, he's such an artist, artist, um, an artist producer that he's always just got people around meditating, drinking coffee or just like chilling out at his place. So Jamie. he invited us around and we went into the studio. He had another friend there, um, Sierra Denton, who's an incredible songwriter. Mm. And we all just started sort of like talking about, you know, music that we were listening to and loving. And we and we just started like jamming some some ideas and um by the end of that day we had perfect and invisible from gothic summer and we were all very excited about it um and that really spurred the motivation i suppose to just create the rest of this record and just sort of you know seeing where it went um and it was just yeah it was just a really beautiful energy it was it was all created in the spirit of having fun and just like true collaboration and there was no sort of laborious process sometimes it's a lot of purging or it's trying to you know find inspiration whereas this record just came very easily for us and um yeah that's what we spoke to Brittany about too which she's amazing we we love chatting to her um about that process so it was just a really special time it, it definitely um it definitely sort of encompassed you know a feeling that we had this last year of just these songs when I look back through all the songs you've done, going back to, and I can't believe how long you've been around at this point, because I remember the first time I heard Forever, and I can't believe how long ago that is now, like 17 years ago or something. Yeah, yeah. almost tw 20 years next year. Jesus. Is, uh, the anniversary of that release. Good yeah. Lord. Um, <laughs> something that is uniform about your catalog is you guys have such a sense of like rowdiness and fun and humor in everything you do. Like not every artist like gets to be like funny while per making pop music. How important is it for you to have that kind of lightheartedness to have a sense of humor in your music that you put out into the world. I love that you said the humor because this, this album was, um, 
like a dark comedy humor <laughs> we're saying we, we wrote these songs because we you know we laugh so we don't cry you know and that is what a gothic summer is to us it's Which is like really just being human right finding the finding the humor um in life and you know being able to express that in our sort of you know in our tone in our own way um is very much been the theme for gothic summer it feels like australians in general you, you would be hard-pressed to find an Australian who doesn't have a bit of a sense of humor. Am I wrong? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do love to laugh. We love to laugh at ourselves. It's a very self-deprecating kind of humor that happens it's in Australia. It's a self-deprecating culture in Australia. It, it is. So I mm. think that, yeah, Australians love a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, going even off of what Lewis was saying about, you know, like it's like he's 20 years, you know, since so forever. Um, and I want to say that anytime I'm at a party, I'm always throwing on Untouched. Of like course. that will set off any gay party. You're, you're on Fire Island. You're at a house party. Like doesn't matter where you are. Like people are going to go up for it. And I just wonder. You know, you're preparing to go on tour again, and you have these songs in your catalog that you've been performing. You know, for almost 20 years at this point. Do you ever feel like you want to like play them differently like are the, how how do you keep yourself excited um about music that you've just had in your life for years i think it's you know the fans that keep us so excited the reaction to the music every time we play it it's different and it's so you know it's so huge um the way that they throw energy at us and sing along and seeing the faces as soon as like the first few chords start in, in any of the first, you know, few albums, um, you know, it's like they go through this, this very visceral ex like feeling and you're sitting in front of you. So it's really hard not to just like dive into that feeling. Also, and also when the live shows themselves, it's, it's when you're on stage and you've got the, the, the full band, uh, you know, it does take on a whole different energy than just the records. So I think we've always prided ourselves on the energy of the live show and how we can translate the songs in kind of different and unique ways. I mean, sometimes we'll play them even acoustic mm. or also I have we'll, to say, we'll, we'll do them like our, our live show is very, yeah, it's very rock. Different. It's very rock and roll. But and also, like, to be honest, when we're on stage, we're not overly conscious. Like, as performers, you're sort of, like, channeling and, and you're so in it that it's – you're not on stage having this conscious thought, like, oh, I'm so bored singing this song. Like, <laughs> you're throwing yourself into every moment. It's it's not – for yeah. me, it's not a conscious um, headspace to be in. It's, it's very, like, I don't know. Other, yeah, so it's almost otherworldly yeah. to be on stage and – um, performing so I don't know I don't know it would be bizarre to me if I ever heard a performer say that they were bored on stage or over it because I feel like that would mean that they're not quite in the moment mm -hmm. like you know you're transported to where you were when you were writing it and it's a lot of different things that happen I think when you're when you're on stage and well, you're almost re-experiencing the music through your audience's eyes mm -hmm. in that sense you know and it's such a blessing yeah. like we feel so lucky that you know almost 20 years later when we sing that song everyone is still like passionately if more, screaming more, more passionate at the top of their lungs <laughs> than and, they were in the yeah you, i need you to play leave me alone because oh, yes. that's that's my oh, jam no! that is my a jam you will see me screaming <laughs> That's that's true fan. Uh, that's a true fan song right there that you just cited. That's so sweet. Um, we would love to play that live for you. <laughs> you also said um, in an interview that among your only regrets while making music is when you sort of listen to people at the label more than you listen to your own voice when putting together music. And to me, that says you two generally agree most of the time. Um, what uh, what like subjects or. What when it what are you likeliest to disagree with one another when it comes to making music? We we don't to be honest. I'll, I'll say, I I've got something for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've got something. So the only time you'll see Jess and I creatively disagree <laughs> is when we love a song so much we both want to put down. 
the lead vocal. <laughs> so like we will fight over who gets to sing what. But it's purely, we always say like, that is usually the indication of a really good song yeah, because we both, we both really, otherwise we'll be like, you go in and put that vocal you down. You would sound great on you this would part. Sound really <laughs> this part, it's you, it's your voice. It's I all you, babe. It. It's all you. Whereas if we're fighting over who gets to sing what we're using, we're very excited about it. And I think that's like, that's like the tick of approval that, okay, this is, we've got something special here. So it's usually if we're not, not fighting, fighting that, that you know, there's a problem, the problem there. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you've mentioned before too you know when you were just sort of like thinking about music you're always writing music first whether or not it's supposed to be a new Veronica's album um, I'd be interested to know you know what kind of um, things you create that don't end up becoming sort of a Veronica's album like are there certain sounds that you go into the studio or maybe even certain genres that you've played in before that aren't really appropriate for like if you put it out as a Veronica album album your fans would be like okay this is a genre shift um like like what other sounds um and things do you two love creating we've been blessed in the veronica's where we've been a able to channel a lot of different influence so mm -hmm. i actually think you know as songwriters first which we signed a publishing deal at the age of 17 so two years before we ever even uh signed a record deal um and so the heart of us are truly songwriters and in that sense I think how you produce a song kind of creates the genre almost because the blueprint of the Veronica's sound is our songwriting and our harmonies and our sort of intrinsic connection as sisters in which we kind of have our own language, I guess, which is the DNA or the blueprint of what we do. And then as far as the way we produce that up, I guess it's whatever's really inspiring us at the time. You know, Jesse and I have never really felt like we were stuck to one genre in particular. Like, I guess that's the, the true blessing of music and the way we express ourselves as writers as well. I, I think we could write absolutely anything. And, you know, our fans, um, the people who love our music connect with it because it's authentically us. We drew a lot of, I mean, you know, the music that we listen to that's, you know, people are always like, oh, do you listen to pop music? And we're like, not anymore. Not really. Mm. Um, we're not listening to the top 40. We're not really listening to a lot of um, mainstream pop stuff. We listen to a lot of blues. We listen to country. We listen to, I listen to a lot of meditation, like Hindu music. Um, pretty much any genre that is doing something different to pop. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we do draw our inspiration from a lot of different places. That being said, you know, we have, I think we are known for, um, you know, I, maybe our, I, I don't know. I suppose like the, the songs that have really connected and hit in, at least in Australia in a big way is the dance floor anthems. Mm -hmm. um, we were very much inspired when we wrote that, that era of Hook Me Up. The whole album was very much inspired by that sort of underground electronic, electro dance pop scene that was going on yeah. um, with a lot of cool bands like shiny toy guns and under the influence of giants and all those guys mm. that you know i'm not sure if a lot of them are even bands anymore but um at different periods of our lives the stuff that's kind of inspiring us is what we tend to create from and i don't know that we've over, uh, been overly conscious or thought that we need to create stuff that we've never put ourselves in a box i guess creatively the is what i'm saying artistically is our pop baby like mm -hmm. it's our it's our space to put our you know, all of our creativity to do with pop culture, um, which is why so much of this new album is social commentary on pop culture. And but also so much of this record is cross-genrally. Cross like we have, uh, you know, a punk ska song called Detox Pop Punk, I guess mm -hmm. you call it. Uh, and then we have like, you know, a heartfelt like ballad called Rib Cage. And then there's your, your, your straight up rock pop stuff like Perfect and Invisible. And then, you know, at the end, we've got a song called Jungle that is like wild throwback surf guitars, 60s. the stuff that we grew up with. You know, our parents were, um, our dad was in a band. Our mom was a beach babe of the 60s, that surf culture. So we really drew a lot of the influence from the stuff we grew up listening to, which I would say is nothing like anyone's ever heard from the Veronica's before. So it was a lot of fun for us to actually inject a lot more of the stuff we love and that is truly a part of our DNA into um, the music. Also, it must be said, the origin story of the name the Veronica's is one of my favorite 
band beginnings, which is inspired by the movie Heathers. Yes. Um, when uh, somebody asks, are you a Heather? And, and Renata Ryder responds, no, I'm a Veronica, which to me says that's a movie that's important to you. Um, what other, and, and also speaks again to the humor of you guys, like the, the kind of the, the Morden quality. Um, what like, <laughs> movies st- like, have stuck with you over the years that you guys uh, consider most important to you? Ooh, I love that question. Um, there were a lot of 90s films that, you know, definitely impacted and shaped us. The Craft was one. It came out Dang. in 96, yeah. I think. Please, How yes. Amazing was that cast and the, you know, the whole perspective of just magic and um, power in, in female power. It was very cool. Um, what else? I mean, there was... Um, we also grew up reading Archie comics, so you know it was Betty and the Veronica. other Veronica, yes, Veronica. Yes. 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 Veronica, which was sort of our our taste into like American culture as well, and how cute that was. Like Archie, <laughs> and the whole high school, it was just such a. It's so fu- funny because it was such a kind of foreign idea to us in a way, like the diners and the milkshakes and that fifties kind of feel is so cute. I mean, and the, the thing that I'm a is, Veronica is like, she embodied as well as Winona Ryder, um, being Veronica in, in Heathers was headed. very strong headed women. Um, you know, they kind of, they it was usually the, the alternative. Their own drum. It was the alternative to the mainstream. A bit of the rebel. Mm-hmm. And we always loved that spirit. Um, but like Jesse said, like the nineties was a massive, influence on us so you know courtney love whole mm. you know that right girl movement you love movies what movies have influenced you i well i mean i watch i watch a lot of like like monster of the black lagoon and yeah <laughs> like monster movies yeah creature of the black lagoon it's called. oh sorry um i mean like bella lugosi's dracula duh yeah really old school kind of they, they were really creepy films i'm gonna be honest way more scary than the stuff they make now um but I, th- I think there was a lot of mystery about them that's what i loved about old cinema is they didn't show all the gore it was like it was all in here you know they, also, there was the a Tim lot of that and stuff like stuff that felt whimsical and enchanting rather than like horror i think when we reference gothic culture and we got and we we sort of reference like um you know sort of that kind of cinema it's for us it's the whimsical enchanted stuff not not like horror horror based like you see today um we're actually a bit i'm too sensitive for a lot of horror films i can't watch them but anything yeah. that feels like enchanting and a little bit scary um on an esoteric level and is you know i think we love it um those worlds those characters i like the fantastical stuff yeah like the monsters and you know like lon chaney's frankenstein and just stuff where it's like the monster we always found it interesting in a lot of those kind of in that cinema where the monster was sort of the outcast of society but also the product of the society like the grinch (laughs) (laughs) yes (laughs) constructing that idea of the villain and and the monsters and how all they want is to be loved (laughs) it's like in a way i guess that was a huge influence for gothic summer it's like the shadow part of the human self like the human experience where all the monsters and we're all you know the god consciousness it's it's what you tap into and um i think that just that whole that whole construct is um, fascinating to us and so for gothic summer we definitely you know just dove into some of those ideas and tried to make it into pop music <laughs> i love that the veronicas are universal horror queens yes yeah. we love to hear it <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah i mean you mentioned hole as well you know and we're, we I feel like 90s um rockers uh, female rock bands are like the bat signal to me and lewis oh yeah uh and you've been oh, you know cool. yeah you know absolutely we we talked about garbage um oh, earlier in this i have episode. all of those fairs albums on vinyl yeah. so yes yeah uh, <laughs> as women who've been uh in the industry you know for over 20 years now um I just are there any sort of uh, other bands, um, artists who maybe you've performed with or, you know, um, been on the same bill with or something that you feel like you sort of developed maybe a special kinship with or like you learned something from them early on in your career that you've always taken with you? You know, we grew up when we first moved to Los Angeles, um, we lived next door pretty much to Katy Perry. Oh, <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> so it was really fun because on the weekends, our, we, we lived with a million people. It was like this really crazy com- communal household. And on the weekends, um, everyone was so in love with music and creativity. We would hold these big nights where 
if you were an artist, you could get up with your acoustic guitar and sing your songs. And so, you Just know. At our house, like a house party. But you get party. about 200, 250 people Showing coming up, through and just. Getting up and performing. And so Katie would get up and she would sing her songs on the acoustic guitar and we would get up. And there were so many other amazing artists at the time that were just like wanting to share what they were doing or what they wrote that week. And it was just such a beautiful community that we were welcomed into from the very beginning of our time here in mm -hmm. Los Angeles. And, you know, we learned a lot from those people. Um, there's another guy, Jay Buchanan would get up. He's the, the lead singer of um, a Rival band Sons. called Rival Sons. And just like incredible artists at their rawest, in their rawest form in that way, like just them and acoustic their voice and their newer songs. Same with Phoebe so, Bridges. We would go yeah. and, and yeah. watch her play sort of singer songwriter nights in Nashville and then some some in Los Angeles and there would be like, you know, 50 people in the room kind of thing. And there are so many – that's what's so beautiful about America is like there's so many opportunities. So, so or there used to be. I don't know. It's different now with the internet. Um, this was, again, like a little bit pre-internet um, first, you know, from 2005 to 2010. Um, you know, there was so much community going on and, and ways to really just share within that, um, that artist space. Um, it's a bit sad now, I think with the rise of the internet, you lose that a little bit, or maybe there's other ways to do that online. I think now it's an online community, um, that you see that, but, but there's nothing like sitting physically in front of an artist, uh, and experiencing that. Lana, where you, Lana where you sort of know, like Lana you just Dore. feel like, wow, this is so special. I feel like I'm experiencing something that is going to affect me for the rest of my life in a way. And I think that was really a pivotal time for us growing up in the industry. And I think it was and, the songwriting. And experiencing these amazing songwriters that were women, yeah. that were our age, that were um, killing it. And I mean, gone on to do incredible things. Mm. So, Yeah. Well, the new album is fabulous. Thank you both for joining us. Yeah. We'll be listening to you for the next tw 20 years and then 20 years beyond that. Yeah. So. Oh, thank you. I love you guys. Cheers. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Let's talk nonsense. Please. Uh, Sydney Sweeney is back. Has the bitch left? I'm going to say, she, she was here minutes ago. <laughs> she is the only it's time person. time to Irish goodbye. She's the only person releasing movies in this quarter. Yeah. <laughs> no, five in a row. Uh, she's back and she's taking a break from the rom-coms and deadpan superhero movies to dip her toes into religious horror with her new movie, Immaculate, where she plays a nun who, you guessed it, has a seemingly immaculate conception. Um, I think I would have loved this movie more had I not seen uh, any other movie in my life. Because... <laughs> I'm, I'm stealing this take from my friend Jordan because it's like they introduce this nunnery or whatever that she's a part of and something's off about it. And so you have to sit there and be like, oh, I wonder if a Suspiria is going on. And then yes. it ends up being this like the men are running a Rosemary's Baby yeah. operation. And then, oh, now she it's the movie is basically if Mother Mary were a final girl. That's yeah. the pitch. You can pick you can picture the pitch meeting. Um, and the it, movie is a little the movie is a little boring. Yeah, uh, it's, but, boring but... it's boring, too. It's boring, too. A great ending is a great ending. <laughs> yes. I not that I it was sort of a rosemary's baby thing where you get a sense of what the the spawn yeah. is. That was a good final acting moment. I would compare yeah. it to maybe um Natalie Portman in May December where you get this close up of her yeah. having this heaving experience. Yeah. Um, or maybe the end of Texas Chainsaw Massacre where yeah. that girl's on the back of a truck sort of um hyperventilating. Yeah. A lot of the movie too seem very inspired by like uh Repulsion, yes. Polanski's, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, like the hands coming out of the wall, grabbing at Catherine Deneuve. Right. Uh, that's mentioned that name in forever on uh, this podcast. Oh, speaking of throwback, you, <laughs> it must be 2019. Um, no, but I think that's also a part of why this movie isn't good. It's like all together. It's for me. Altogether, it's too pastiche. It reminds mm. you of every other movie about this subject, and I do like the subject of nuns in movie. I would also yeah. say none is how many stars I would give this movie. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Give you some Gene Shallot right there. Um, Let's I just, have none of that. <laughs> and then there were none of that. Um, I mean, like, I like the idea of if, if, if there are nuns in a movie, usually somebody is a naive or something crazy happens and you get to see a nun gulp. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's such thing as a nun movie where you don't see the nun gulp mm -hmm. and, and be um, scandalized and astounded by something that is happening maria she was constantly shook please yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was, was going to, on she was trying to solve a problem too <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> There's more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, none movies that you like then. Okay. I am going to start with. Well, okay. I'll start with Sister Act. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that because that is actually the nun. Yes. Yeah. That movie does not follow any of the conventions of a nun movie, other than there are nuns who gulp at how yes. um how much she's breaking the rules and stuff. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the liveliness it conjures, just the fact that it's a comedy and it's not really about just how uptight the nuns are. Mm -hmm. That is it, that's what makes it because she's know, on the run from the mob. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. I always forget that she's with Harvey Keitel in the beginning of that movie, and I always forget how hot Harvey Keitel was. Oh yeah, and by the way, he, talk, he was the Sidney Sweeney of his day. He was in every movie at that time. <laughs> the Sidney Sweeney of his day. <laughs> <laughs> what was his euphoria? Yeah, Ooh, right. No, but just like he was in everything from the piano to that, you yeah. know. So, uh, no, I mean, Sister Act is a perfect movie. Sister Act Two is a perfect movie. Um, Allegedly, there'll be a Sister Act 3, but I just think that that maybe that was one of my first introduction to nuns. You know, I was raised Baptist, so I wasn't seeing these nuns run around. And what happened uh, to those morals, would you say? Yeah. You know what? I lost them dancing. Okay. okay? <laughs> Should have banned dancing. Real, real footloose shit. Yeah. <laughs> I will say my favorite drama about nuns ever is a movie called, I think I've brought it up on this podcast before, The Nun Story, which is from the 50s. It's uh -huh. Audrey Hepburn entering a convent and without giving it away um it's about a woman just questioning her choice to be there uh -huh. and like interacting with the rituals of catechism and questioning them and it's it seems like a really small movie it is directed by um known epics great fred zinneman who did like from here to eternity among others julia whatever uh and it's my favorite audrey hepburn performance i really really recommend this movie and also all of the nuns in it are like the most famous character actresses of that time so you have everyone from the oscars fags are going to start screaming dame <laughs> edith evans to mildred dunnick to beatrice Strait. like everybody whoever was nominated for supporting actors for being somebody that hit someone with the ruler they're in the movie well you know that is your best performing youtube video apparently talking about, talking about the women yeah i did a best actress video that's apparently catching on on youtube please watch it again that's like one of the few audrey hepburn movies that i think i haven't seen mm -hmm. actually so there's not too many audrey hepburn movies so yeah you know she died on that boat yeah <laughs> of course yes <laughs> <laughs> um i love this movie by my favorite director al mm. uh dark habits let me just say the play on the word habit a slay every time yes change of habit with mary tyler moore and elvis presley where she plays a nun and after filming that movie elvis had said that he slept with all of his leading ladies except for one and mary tyler moore said well i know who the one is <laughs> she wouldn't have any of that no she's like this is toxic <laughs> I'm going to go Pris back to Grant Tinker over here. She was calling the house. Priscilla, get out. <laughs> <laughs> Throw your hat been... in the air, Priscilla. <laughs> that would have been such a good scene in Priscilla. <laughs> Very Moore just calls her. I have a car. Get yeah. out. Yeah. Girl, he tried to fuck me. I'm not doing that. <laughs> uh, Dark Habits is, is one of his early films. I've been sort of revisiting the earlier films that I hadn't seen before or that I haven't seen in a long time. And Dark Habits is just... It's wild. It's just nuns um, snorting cocaine. Oh, good. Um, drinking. It's you know, it's Almodovar. You know, so like it's, it's always going to be some fucked up shit happening. Um, and it's it's a really funny movie. I just want to say also that Pedro Almodovar is one of the greatest interviewees of all time. Literally, mm. just take an afternoon and read any interview he's ever done. He's so insightful and knows everything, and is very um, choosy about what a star is, which I love. Yes. Um. Um famously you know angelina jolie chasing him on that oscars carpet and he's like Cast me and he's like i'm just not sure yeah he's like you don't speak english <laughs> <laughs> and now he's making his english movie that he has not called her <laughs> strange she is by the phone like diane warren yeah no kidding <laughs> would love to see her in a nun movie by the way um somebody who is in two of my favorite nun movies of all time deborah carr uh, who's in this movie called Heaven Knows Mr. Ellison in the 50s, where it's her and Robert Mitchum, and it's basically the original Six Days, Seven Nights. Two mm -hmm. people are on an island, and like they don't seem like they're going to match up. He's really gruff. She's really prim, wearing the habit all the time. And then it's also in the middle of World War II, so they're dealing with like invaders and hiding themselves and survival. So good. It is so entertaining. It's just a real star chemistry movie. Um, and But of course, she's also in maybe one of the most revered um, nun movies of all time which is called Black Narcissus from the <laughs> 40s which is the most beautiful Technicolor movie you will ever see maybe number one I'm not kidding 
mm-hmm. where she plays a nun who's sent to the Himalayas and deals with honestly some some of the most exoticized form of natives you will ever see. So there's some problems there. Mm-hmm. But the art direction of the movie, which is Oscar winning, unbelievable. And you also get Gene Simmons, um, who is in Guys and Dolls among other movies. Uh, in Kiss as well. Say what? <laughs> not the same. Not, he's okay. not in Kiss. <laughs> not in, um, she is in brown face in this movie, but for a wordless performance, oh. pretty good. <laughs> she also plays in Elmer Gantry, this woman who is sister something. I don't know if she's technically a nun. She calls herself a sister. But Elmer Gantry, uh, a movie about televangelists and the money you get from like riling people up in religious ecstasy. Awesome fucking movie. Okay. I recommend that too. Okay. Adding both of those to the letterboxed watch Please. list. Which you so you do letterbox reviews. I love letterbox. How am I not on? Oh, I know why. Because they don't let you do four star reviews. We talked about this. <laughs> you gotta get over that. I'm sorry. I'm right and they're wrong. Well, first of all, let's categorize a five star review. Okay. okay? For me. So, like I, I will go through what I think like some reviews are. Okay. I put Dead Reckoning at a three. Okay, responsible. Thank you. Okay. I thought you were about to say it was a five, and I was like, I'll leave my no, own podcast. No, it was a four when I first saw it. I just, I just, you know, you can re-log movies. Yeah. Uh, it was a four when I saw it, because it was thrilling. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't, like, my favorite Mission Impossible. Rewatching it on the plane here, I gave it a three, because I'm like, it's tedious. And also, like, do we really need to parachute onto the fucking train? I yeah. mean, like, what, like, pre-Hitchcock <laughs> shit is this? <laughs> yeah. I think a three-star movie in, like, a five-star category is, like, Perfectly in the middle. It yeah. could be bad. It could be good. But I enjoyed it. Okay. And I'll, I know for, I mean, Vanessa Kirby's Chattering Pupils almost elevated a half mm-hmm. star. And then four is like, four is a really good movie. You really enjoyed it. It's just missing that, you know, that, that je ne sais quoi. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Five is like, I'm gagging. Yeah, right. You know? Okay. Okay. So you think there are meaningful demarcations between all this. Does this mean you don't use half stars? I do use half stars. That's just it. When you add half stars, there's too many gradations. I just feel like four, three and a half, three, two and a half, two, two and a half, or one and a half, and then bomb, as Leonard Malton would say. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the ideal range. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's a lot of movies here with like just half a star of okay. a review. Because, you know, I wouldn't give anything zero stars because somebody was working, even if it was craft services. <laughs> I, I got to support the team. Yeah, right, right. Uh, also, I love about Letterbox is they have their, uh, like, basically just like the watch list. Like, when you add things to watch, it's like, I literally have all these movies that I want to see. Oh, no, that is nice. I, I have to say, I, I forget to keep track of what I say I want to see. Yeah. It would be nice to have that all in one place. So, it's beautiful to have that. Mm-hmm. So I saw St. Omer on that list. Really good. Yeah. Um, what else? What other nut movies? Oh, uh, uh, I should say something quickly about Agnes of God, which is a Jane, uh-huh. Jane Fonda movie from the mid '80s, where she's like a detective investigating a woman who has this um, religious stigmata esque mm-hmm. thing occur to her, and they're wondering how it happened or why it happened. Uh, Meg Tilly was nominated for an Oscar for playing this nun, and it's based off a play in which Amanda Plummer won a Tony. If you want to see like a haunted nun movie that also just feels a little bit like a mystery, mm-hmm. I would recommend that. Right. Okay. Um, I'm sure it's just like the nun too. Yeah, the same. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's also Ken Russell's The Devils. Oh, Vanessa Redgrave. Yeah, that's when you should. We should have known. This bitch is zany. <laughs> She'll do anything. Yeah. Yeah, that is on Criterion now. Still, I think mm. it leaves in like a month. Uh, so I just watched it recently. It's fucking amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And One Ken, of a kind movie. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Ken Russell as a director is. You don't know what you're gonna get. Right. I mean, you know what you're gonna get. But it's it, crazy. It's that Cronenberg thing of here I go again. Yeah. Oh my so, god. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Like I mentioned it before, the Charlie's Angel scene. I just love a movie where people dress up as nuns too. Sure. Yeah. It's I funny. feel like. Yeah. It's funny. I feel like I feel like Scooby Doo is dressed up as a nun many times. <laughs> probably. It's also a weirdly a constant sleigh Halloween costume. Why? Why is it so good? Yeah. I I will say that. Maybe it's because I went to a Jesuit school, but I routinely remember like just a straight guy dressed as a nun is funny to me. Yeah. I guess there's just a whole personality associated with being a nun. So mm-hmm. in addition to wearing an outfit, you're putting on a um, a prim, self-serious persona. Yeah. Um, I don't have that much else to say about nuns. No. Here's the thing. I do enjoy the movie Doubt. Yeah. And the nominations therein. You've got your Philip Seymour Hoffman, Amy Adams, Meryl Streep. 
think I'd probably rank it like 15th or 16th among her acting nominations, though. Meryl? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like it could have been other people. In fact, right now on Broadway, it's uh, Amy Ryan, Oscar nominee for what movie? Oh, The Fighter. Nope. Gone Baby Gone. Oh. Yeah. One of those Boston rough and tumble yeah. <laughs> movies. Uh, you know what? Fair guess. Fair guess. <laughs> you know, yeah. she she and Casey were knocking them back last night, probably. Uh, <laughs> I think we hit most of the major non yeah. movies. I love Doubt, though. By the way, uh -huh. you didn't mention because Viola in that, like, oh she, she's God. the top tier yes. in that movie. No, that's uh, that's the explosion moment for her. The, yeah. the what Amy Adams happened, what happened in Junebug for her is. Viola Davis in doubt. Yeah, yes. I mean, that's obviously a great moment in a movie, but that is the sort of thing that you can tell this came from a play because that 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 just scene in the play is just mesmerizing. I also, you know what? As much as I want Viola Davis to take lead roles and dominate a movie, when she comes in with the sneak attack performance, mm -hmm. she's so good at it, too. Yeah. I love, bewitch us a little bit. I mean, she, she you don't watch the DC things. Um, like the Suicide Squad oh. and stuff, or then Peacemaker, the TV show, which she nope. plays Too Amanda. Too busy having sex. <laughs> you could do both. I, I've never seen it done. For Sorry. some people, that's a turn on. Okay. okay? <laughs> Watching Viola Davis as Amanda Waller, that is my turn on. Okay. okay? Blocked. <laughs> Her in a nice suit, just walking around, uh, being bossy. I love it. Okay. What are we going to do with Viola Davis? I know. Well, it's, it's. I want more for her. Well, it, but it's also one of those things where, again, when you look through Angela Bassett's filmography, you realize she's played every iconic role there is, really. Yeah. For you know, like like black woman in history, like t time in memoriam, she's played them all, and like we we need more people writing specifically to those people. I yeah. think for how iconic they are. But we need a twist, you know, yeah. because I'm like. When you think of Meryl Streep's filmography, because Viola Davis always says in interviews, people call me, people call me the Black Meryl Streep, you know. But I don't have Meryl Streep's roles, you know. Um, give her like a um, give Viola Davis the She Devil. Yes. Give her a Death Becomes Her. Uh, yes, and she is. I mean, Viola She's is funny. so funny in interviews. Viola and Angela in a Death Becomes Her type movie. Please God. Yeah. Oh my God. But those are the kind of movies they don't get. No. And in fact, for a while, we just would make Angela Bassett third build in things. She would be literally in Music of the Heart as yeah. somebody who's telling Meryl Streep, you better play the violin for those kids. <laughs> a very haunting Wes Craven movie. Right. That once was supposed to star. I don't remember. Madonna. Oh, and then they okay. had creative differences. I assume Madonna was creatively different in how she tried to act. <laughs> That uh, Meryl Streep role almost went to Madonna. Society should be talking about this more. I would love to be in the room with, maybe no one ever told Meryl. Uh, right. You won't Until believe. later. <laughs> I mean, it's literally like, yeah, uh, this almost went to Pia Zadora. Yeah. Um, or maybe she was just on set with him like, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> She's fully dating Martin Short, right? Okay. They're I at the theater together. First of all, I don't know why they would lie to us in a Kate Middleton way, but they are doing that. <laughs> yeah. And also, it's like, I hate to say this, Meryl, your performance is unconvincing. <laughs> it's upsetting to me. Martin, also like that, like footage of them leaving a restaurant and then they're getting in separate cars and he's like, love you, kid, or whatever. And she says something similar back. It's like, guys, let's, let's talk about the verbiage here. Yeah. It is giving, it is giving classic rom-com, though. Yes. Older actors pretending they're not together for the press. I don't know why. That should be a movie. Yeah. How is it not a movie? Have, have they done anything together besides Only Murders? I don't think so. Okay. I, don't I, gotta, so. I gotta catch up then. Yeah, right. right. No, this is great promo. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's what they're doing. Mm, smart. Yeah, a promo relationship. Uh, but, you know, a Sean and Camila. Yeah. <laughs> oh, remember those days? Yes. Uh. All right. When we're back, keep it. And we are back for our favorite segment of the episode, Crosstalk. <laughs> I'm Paul Begala. Who is on that show? <laughs> Crossfire. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Lewis, what is your keep it? My keep it is a very general stand up y keep it. Okay. Um, Love that. What is the deal? Precisely. With airplane food. Yeah. That's exactly what's about to happen. Um, keep it to in 2024, still using the phrase, so and so was not on my bingo card okay excuse me i still see it all the time this feels like a niche problem at this point like i know you first saw this phrase online in 2018 or 2019 or something i still see it all the time i've I heard people say it right yeah, out loud so, right and that is even crazier I, it, it's like 
I'm going to say Gen X women are still saying it all the time. And I say this as somebody who keeps buying your album. Stop. <laughs> Please stop doing this. Tori Amos does it. No, I am. Yes. <laughs> However, somebody posted a picture of Dua Lipa holding a vinyl of Mariah Carey's Memoirs of an Imperfect Angel. And the caption says, Dua Lipa being a memoir stand was not on my bingo list. A bingo list? Girl, let's get the phrase <laughs> right. <laughs> Have Wait, you played bingo? There's no list. She was holding that album? Yes. Look at. First of all, as a lamb. Please. That is, you know I love that album. That album is iconography. Yeah. Okay. Memoirs of an Imperfect Angel. I love that album. And it, it, deser- it deserves more credit in Mariah's discography. And I hadn't seen that photo. You know, this, I might need to get back on Twitter. I was just talking about. I the- miss things. Oh, no. I, right. Things like this. It's so exciting. Um, mm-hmm. I also just want to say in an unrelated gamer way. Keep it to when you play Scrabble and you use all seven tiles in your rack. Mm-hmm. Do you know what that's called? A Scrabble? A bingo. Oh. Excuse me. That's a different game. <laughs> if I'm playing Uno and I'm down to one card, do you know what I don't yell? Yahtzee. <laughs> Keep the games to separate. Stay in your lane, bingo. I love that you're still playing Scrabble. Oh, please. You're me, Scrabbling. Me and my mom and Roxanne Gay. Great Scrabble player. Oh, I thought you were saying like the three of you play no. together. <laughs> I'd like to see it. Yeah. <laughs> We're rarely in the same place at the same time. I think that if people are going to keep doing the bingo cart joke, we should be required at the beginning of the year to make pop culture bingo cards. Uh, yes. Let's just actually literalize this. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No, but like literally if you have the instinct to say so-and-so was not on my bingo cart, delete, hit the deletes, hit the deletes, and then just say, this surprised me. Just like get past the cliche and just yeah. say what you want to say about this, which is that this news is shocking to you. Oh my gosh, she loves this album that I also love. That's great. <laughs> yeah. That makes me relate to Dua Lipa. <laughs> Take the joke out of it and sound like somebody who just learned English. Yes. I think that's also a problem of like, the internet currently. It's no one can actually just express, oh, this shocked me or, oh, I'm elated by this, you know, like I enjoy seeing someone do this, right? It's always, you have to make a joke about it. And you have to borrow some word template that's been used 25,000 times before. And then it counts as content. Yeah. And it's like, okay, kudos for sharing that. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) I like how fast that one burned. Okay. On Drag Race last week, somebody said in response to somebody's very harrowing personal story, kudos for sharing that. Thanks for spilling. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Plain Plain Jane said that to Q. I do want to say that was after Q shared um, their um, HIV diagnosis. Yes. Besides the point, the most harrowing part of that whole scene for me was Q said that they had been diagnosed for two years uh, and they got their diagnosis when they were 24. And I'm sorry, Q is not 26. No, well, that is not the face of a 26 year old. Drag queens have a whole <laughs> different metric when it comes to how old they are or were. It just, everybody's every age at all times. It's like Celine Dion. Baby, Gen Z, Gen Z the way they're aging, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Q looks like a golden girl. <laughs> I do miss getting things like that. Like, just daily gay updates mm-hmm. from Twitter. Like, Dua Lipa holding a Mariah Carey album. Uh, but... Ain't nothing wrong with a Twitter account called Daily Gay Updates, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> but I will say, the lack of one means that that thanks for spilling meme did not burn for me. It's still funny for me. Oh, I've truly I see. only seen two jokes of it, like, in meme form on Instagram. Oh, God. You're behind. Yeah. I'm just saying, for the sake of this podcast, get back on Twitter. I know, I know, because I'm honestly in group threads now, and people are, like, sharing news with me. Mm. And oh. I'm like, I used to be the news sharer. Oh, imagine someone having to share news yeah, with you. Yeah, like, oh. you know. Let's used, get you to bed, Grandma. Okay, I mean, like, I used to be the one yelling, read all about it, yeah. with my little <laughs> tricycle, <laughs> throwing the paper the at the neighbor's door. The loudest newsy in the neighborhood. <laughs> you slept on the top bunk. <laughs> Okay, so if I keep it this week, child, the Kate Middleton shit. Oh my, I, I'm actually so overwhelmed that you would even say the words. Okay, first of all, this isn't a direct response to a video that John Lovett might have made mm. for Crooked Media, but it's not, not a direct response. And also to the people post Kate Middleton, obviously there were the rumors, uh, the nastiness, people were like, where is she? And then she came out and said, you know, she has cancer. Mm -hmm. 
So there is now a lot of people online who are jumping on their Casey Musgraves high horse <laughs> yes. and saying, how dare you, you know, shame and bully this woman into revealing personal information, you know, like she deserves privacy. And sure, women deserve privacy in their, you know, medical history, whatever, um, the procedures that they're going through. Most women and people writing about this and comparing themselves to Kate Middleton are not figureheads of a monarchy yeah, with right. a history of colonialism and bloodshed and like murdering Princess Diana. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Like, first of all, it made sense to question what was going on with Kate Middleton's disappearance because they've disappeared people. And also, by the way, it was the most botched PR of all time. Right. First of all, the first announcement said, this is not cancer. Right. And they kept saying she was well. Yeah, they kept, kept saying, saying she was well. And then two, while she's recovering, the PR team is running around releasing bad Photoshop uh, of her. And then also claiming that she is the one who did the bad Photoshop. Right. They like blamed it on her or she decided to take the fall. She, or if she felt obligated to take the fall. No idea what happened there. There's no clarity about that issue. So with all this crazy PR bungling going on, people are going to be wondering, like, you're the royal family. Yes. And... I don't know this. I don't know how we jump to this point where now you're defending like everyone involved with the royal family and privacy, et cetera. Like you, you join the royal family. Yeah. Like the, the whole point of it is you're the state. Uh, and it's just going back to this thing of like whenever there's a news story, people always try to find some way to relate to it and make it about them. And I'm, I'm sorry. I've had people in my family who have had cancer as well. And like, I'm sorry for other people who are going through that currently, but you are not Kate Middleton. Right. It's it's and not like, comparable at all. Right. Yes. There was a piece in The Atlantic where someone compared their story to Kate's and said, you all shamed and bullied her into revealing her diagnosis. I also want to point out, there is no way Kate Middleton has seen any of the things that people have written about her online. <laughs> right. At all. Yeah. And she, has I, not seen, she has not seen late night show jokes about it. Like, she is in that castle. They do not see that shit. I don't even think she has a phone. Also, I just want to be clear. People didn't even know what they were joking about. Right. They're like, we had no information about her. And in fact, we only had misdirects. Yeah. So it's just like, just to be safe, don't make jokes about anything ever. Because it right. might turn out that there's a sad component to it. Like, what are you saying? Yeah. This implication that you could bully someone within the royal family, like the levels of walls of access between someone tweeting a joke and anyone in the royal family seeing that is very slim. Yeah, right. I, I I like to imagine Meghan Markle is really savvy and just like oh, the, oh well, there goes there, mean, there goes that funny girl. I again. mean she's online all the time. Yeah. Okay. Podcasting, but. blogging, <laughs> buy, buying things off QVC. Yeah. Like <laughs> Meghan Meghan Markle is in it. She she and Harry stay online. I'm but. sure. But Kate, Will, they yeah, have definitely. no idea what anyone is saying about them online at all yeah i don't think so. there's been no indication otherwise yeah i've never seen them crack anything close to a joke which would indicate they have some sardonic impulse that would put them online yeah and it's really just a lot of people acting like oh you, you, you've treated this woman horribly i'm like she's not seeing it right yeah yeah a lot of projection yeah there's a lot of projection and monday morning quarterbacking you know yeah to, to use a sports metaphor which i'm sure works which also by the way you're accusing like the media of you know profiting off of the mystery surrounding kate and now the media is profiting off of shaming people for profiting off of the mystery right you know like it's it's you're still talking about her and now she, I'm in the future, I'm sure she'll become an advocate in a certain way or whatever. I'm not, it's, it's a horrifying, har harrowing situation. But uh, anyway, it's a story we can now put behind us, I think. Even though, so did she have a body double a couple times? That too! Yeah. That was not her. I'm like, sorry, it was not her. That that video where she's like walking by that farmer's market. So that wasn't her or yeah. was her? I just want to know. That's the whole thing. So does everybody. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never mind. It's not behind us at all. I'm still thinking about it. Yeah. Anyway, that's our show. That's our show. Thank you to the Veronicas for Good joining Lord us. Good Lord, did we cover a lot today. Yeah. Baby, that's what we do here. Oh, my God. I'm going to New York. I'm taking time off. <laughs> Don't call me. 